Hey everybody, this is Justin Michael Williams and I am so excited and so honored to be with you all today in this incredible session that we've come together to stand together in the power of our resilience, in the power of freedom, and in the power of change. And I wanna tell you that the fact that we are even here having a conversation like this about mental health or about mindfulness or about living in our creative power or celebrating the truth of who it is that we really are is revolutionary. It's absolutely revolutionary. And the reason why I say that is because for so many of us, we are the first people in our families, we rise LA. We are the first people in our generations or in our lineages, Grant Park. We're the first people in our cities sometimes with the opportunity to even think about things like mental health or manifesting or life purpose. So many of our ancestors had to sacrifice and give up these things to create stability and the possibility for change for the future generations. And guess what? We are that generation. We have been paid for and we cannot take that for granted. And so here we are together, Los Angeles, coming together from all places all over this city and even extending out into the world with the power not just to heal and change for ourselves, but to heal and change for the generations before us that made this moment possible and the generations for, before us that were not able and were not allowed to do this work. And so here we are. And you know, one of the things that I always say right here in the beginning of this talk is what doesn't heal repeats. What doesn't heal in our life repeats. It repeats in our lives, it repeats in our cities, it repeats in our governments, it repeats in our nation, it repeats in our families, it repeats in our kids until we choose to say the buck stops here. And this is what freedom is about. This is what change is about. And I'm so honored to be with you all today. And we're in for a really dynamic session together. And so I can never really talk about change and transformation without talking to you about a woman that's really important to me and special to me in my life. And it's my grandmother. And my grandmother, in our family, we call my grandma Baca. Now, it's not really a special word. And para mis amigos que hablan español, no es vaca como cow, it's vaca. <laughs> it's, it's un poco diferente. And the reason why I say it that way is because when I was younger, I was just a weirdo little kid, and this is how she became vaca. You know how when you're trying to teach kids how to say words, my parents were trying to teach me to say grandma. And they said, Justin, say grand. And I would say grand. And they would say, say ma. And I would say ma. And they would go, say grandma. And I would go, vaca. And so she became Baca and because I was the oldest, that's what she was called. And several years ago, my Baca, who I was very close to, got diagnosed with stage four cancer. And the doctors told her she only had a couple months to live. And when this happened, it was a huge shock to our entire family. My grandmother was very young. I consider 67. She was very active, healthy, seemingly. And so when we got the news, I flew to where I'm from. I'm actually originally from the Bay Area, but I've lived in LA for 16 years, so I consider myself an Angelino now. But I am originally from the Bay Area, and I flew home from LA to Northern California to where I'm from, from a little town called Pittsburgh, California. And I walked in my grandmother's front door. And when I walked into her front door, she asked me a question that literally changed the trajectory of my entire life. She looked at me and she said, come here, follow me, come to my room, because I've been wanting to talk to you for a long time. And now that I know I don't have a lot of time left, I'm going to ask you now. And so I look at her and I'm thinking, what are you talking about? She said, close your eyes, get still and listen. And then she looked at me and she said, if you were in my shoes and you knew you were going to die, in two months, what would you do? And I looked at her in that moment and I'm looking at her like, what are you even talking about? Like, I'm not dying, you're dying, or maybe I am, but hopefully slower than you. And she's looking at me like, shh. And then she asked it again. She said, I'm gonna ask this question again. And I do not want you to open your lips until you're ready to tell me the truth. Close your eyes, 
do that meditation thing you're always talking about. And then she said it again. If you were in my shoes, she said, and you knew you were going to die in two months, what would you do? And I felt this well of emotions just come running up inside of me and I wanted to cry, but I didn't cry because when I was a kid, they said only faggots cry. And then I just blurted out, I would stop every single thing that I'm doing and I would record an album. I would do music. I would stop hiding the truth of who I was. I would stop living my life based on everyone else's expectations. And I would finally say yes to the real me to the real me that's inside. And my Baca looked at me in that moment and she said, I know, baby, I know. And the thing is, we all have these things. We all have these dreams and these goals and these ideas for our lives that we think are not possible for us because when we were younger, somebody said that dream you have, that dream you have is not for you. It's not for you because you're too fat or you're too old or you're too ugly or you're too gay or you didn't study enough or you're not smart enough or you didn't have that major or you waited too long or you should have done it before you had kids. Whatever it is, we tell ourselves or they tell us that we're not enough and we believe them. And then we begin to oppress ourselves. And so as we talk about this system of freedom and this system of change and this system of transformation, it's about way more than just what it is that you do. Because we all do a lot. We're all so busy all the time. It's more about what you do. It's more than just about what you do. It's about who you're being. This is what gives us freedom and change. And I wanna to talk to you for a second. If you take one thing from me today, I want you to learn this right here at the top of our talk together. There is a difference between change and transformation, Los Angeles. Things change all the time. We change governments, we change where we live, we change our clothes, we change majors, we change on every level, interpersonally, socially, and everything in between. But none of those changes ever have the lasting impact we want them to have if we have not transformed. Transformed within. Transformed in a way that allows us to show up to all the things that we're doing differently. This is how we all can be so busy, but then our busyness doesn't have the impact that we want it to have in our lives. And so this is your moment. This is your time. And right now in this session that we have together, we rise LA, Grand Park, together for the power of resilience, for meditation, for freedom and change. We're not just gonna sit here and meditate and relax. We're gonna wake it up. We're gonna wake up whatever that dream is that's inside of you. Whether it's about your art or your body or your self-love or your finances or that purpose that's been calling to you for years and years, whispering to you at night when you close your eyes to go to sleep. Today, we're gonna to get a little closer to waking that up. And this takes resilience and this takes courage because when we step out, Again, we're not just doing the healing for ourselves. We're not just living our purpose for ourselves. We're doing it so that we can do the work that the generations before us have worked so hard that we here now could have the opportunity to do. So if you're with me, wherever you're watching from right now, you can type in the comments, I'm ready. I'm ready. And then we'll be on a great journey together. So I have to tell you what happened at the end of that story with my grandmother. So my grandmother looks at me in the eyes, you know, after I say that I would do music and do this. And she looks at me and she said, promise me you'll do it. I don't care when, I don't care how, I don't care what it takes. Look at me and promise me you'll do it. And I look at her and I said, I promise. And she said, no, 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 no. Close your eyes. Put your hands over your heart again. And say it again. Say, I promise. And I said, I promise, I promise, I promise. She knew what she was doing. <laughs> she knew what she was doing. Because first of all, you don't, I don't break a promise to Baca. And second, I was making a deep promise to that little boy inside of me who was afraid, who needed me to show up and be the parent or the father 
or the adult that I always needed around me. It was my turn to be that for the child inside of myself. And so as we celebrate, what we're celebrating is our ability to show up for ourselves in a whole new way. This is a part of our resilience and our freedom. And so I promised her, and I had never been in a recording studio. I had never written a song. I had never, I didn't have a record deal. I'd have none of these things. And three years later, after moving through all my fears, a lot of my fears rather, not all of them, after going through feeling like self-sabotage, after feeling like I wasn't good enough, after feeling like I could never do it, I moved through and I put out my first album called Metamorphosis. It's available everywhere that you can stream music, Spotify and whatnot. And when it came out, it charted in the top 20 of the pop charts on iTunes. Top 20 of the iTunes pop charts. And when that happened, I cried and cried and cried. And not just because I, oh, I made it on the charts and my whole life changed overnight. But the reason why I cried is because I remember when I first got into music. So for the record, everybody, I'm 33. I know the black don't crack, but I'm 33. <laughs> and when you know I got into music, I was 26. And I remember having this thought at 26, starting music, which I know 26 is still young, but still starting thinking, gosh, there's all these kids who were doing music like when they were in elementary school and in junior high and in high school. And I was never allowed to really do that stuff. What if I would have started when I was younger? What if I would have had the courage when I was younger to not let the bullies make me think I sucked? What if I would have had the courage to ask my parents for what I really wanted to do, which was cheerleading and dance and ballet and gymnastics instead of letting them force me into basketball and baseball and football and all the shit that I really didn't want to do? Excuse my language, everybody. <laughs> and so what if I really stepped in? And I had this regret when my when I started recording my album, because I thought if I would have just started sooner, I would be so much better. And then when my album charted, this lesson came to me that I think we sometimes all need to hear. And it's that no experience in your life is wasted. Because what I did when I gave up music is I went to college, I went to UCLA, Bruins. I went to UCLA, I studied marketing. I started a marketing company. I got a great marketing job. I was working with some big clients in marketing and that's what I had done for seven years. And so when my album came out, the only reason it charted was guess what? Because I had seven years of marketing experience. And so what that tells you is that no matter what you're doing now, no matter what choices you've made now, no matter how much your brain will try to tell you you're off track or you waited too long or that all this stuff that you've done in the past is a waste of time or you should have done it before, that's all fear because everything that you've done in your life up until now is preparing you for this moment, for this moment. And all it's waiting for you to do is to say yes, to say yes. And so I share all of this with you today, this story for me very vulnerably, not to brag to you at all, LA, but to tell you and it's not even to say like, oh, if I can do this, you can do it too. And it's not to tell you to leave your life and go be an artist or go be, it's telling you that whatever that thing is in your life that you're pressing forward into, whatever that thing is that's whispering to you that you wanna say yes to, whatever that is for you, it's time to say yes to it because that's where your freedom really lies. And today we are going to go through some practical tools on how to wake that up. Does that sound good? So. The reason why I say practical tools is I've had the gift now at this point in my career of being able to share the stages and be behind the scenes with some of the most successful people of our time. And one of the things that I've learned is that people who are successful, and it's not just about money success, I'm talking about people who feel a sense of purpose and aliveness and connection in their lives, regardless of where they are on the financial scale. But I've had the gift of being with people of all kinds. I've worked with literally thousands, of like 40 or 50,000 people in over 40 countries around the world now. And in that gift of this time, one of the things that I saw was that the people who are most empowered, the people who feel most successful, the people who feel most on purpose, all had one thing in common. They all meditated. And it's interesting because we have this kind of propaganda that we feel about meditation. Like, ooh, that's not for us, I don't know. I can't stop doing that. 
I don't know about this. I don't know about that, right? We have all these thoughts about what we think meditation is and what it's supposed to be, but let me keep it super real with you. Meditation, and quite frankly, all the kind of different practices that we've done around transformation and personal growth and spirituality, all of these practices, I need you to listen to me carefully, all of them, not some of them, all of them come from indigenous people and people of color all over this planet. And what's happened over the course of time is these practices have gotten demonized, colonized, corporatized, and then sold back to us in a way that we feel like, mm -mm, that ain't for us. People like us don't do that. Nope, not for us. And why I'm so inspired as a musician and as a creative to help people step back into these practices that come from us is because when we, and by we, I mean anyone who's had to face an uphill battle to enjoy the freedom that is their birthright, when women, when the LGBTQIA plus community, when people of color, when my BIPOC community, when allies, when we step back into these practices, it feels like we're coming home to ourselves, and it feels like we're coming back to our greatest source of power. And so this is what we're going to wake up to this system today. You know, there's a handful of people that I want to tell you, you know, normally when we see and we talk about meditation or about mindfulness, so we're going to do a, a very special practice today. And the practice that we're going to do today is going to help you discover something that I call your unique energy signature. And this energy signature is going to help you become who it is that you're meant to be. This energy signature is what's gonna help set you free in your life and on your purpose. And so stick around for this energy signature practice because we're gonna do it in a moment. But before we do it, I have to tell you a couple interesting things, three important things. So number one is this, is the propaganda of meditation as it got colonized and demonized and all these different things, you know, for many of us, the propaganda of it is it tells us that you know, meditation is only for a certain kind of a person and that meditation looks a certain kind of a way. And typically it's kind of, you know, we all know the image, right? And what's so fascinating is what we don't hear is the people who I've had the gift of hearing from that say that they would not be who they are today if it wasn't for their meditation practices. People like Steph Curry and LeBron James who say that if it wasn't for their meditation and mindfulness practices, they wouldn't be who they are on and off the court. People like Jennifer Lopez and Ariana Grande, Selena Gomez, Lizzo, who says that she would not be able to be a woman in her body in an industry that says someone like her isn't enough if it wasn't for her consistent meditation practice. People like our beloved and late Kobe Bryant, and I wanna to read to you a quote from Kobe. These are words from Kobe's mouth. Kobe says, it's crazy to me that meditation is viewed as hokey. Just look at the people who've done phenomenal things. Do they meditate? Absolutely. And so when I look at this and we look at this array, we don't hear about these people meditating. And the reason why is because the propaganda is keeping it out of our space. But when we come back to these practices, we're coming home to ourselves. So that's point number one. We meditate like Kobe, right? Point number two, nothing that I am teaching you today conflicts with any spiritual or religious beliefs at all. You do not have to be spiritual or religious in any way to meditate. And if you are spiritual or religious, what meditation does is it actually enhances your practice. And let me tell you why. So I'm a very spiritual person, very spiritual person. But again, you do not have to be spiritual or religious to meditate at all. But if you are, because I know many of you are, whatever religion or spirituality you subscribe to, one of my favorite quotes from my book is this. Prayer is when you're speaking to your source of higher power. And meditation is when you're listening to the messages coming back to you. Y'all hear that? Prayer is when you're speaking to your source of higher power and meditation is when you're listening to the messages coming back to you. 
And we all have so much practice asking, praying, show me the way, what do I do? I don't know. We're reading every app, we're getting every reading, we're pulling up the angel cards, we're reading the pattern, we're doing all the things that we have to do. Asking, asking, asking. But if we don't know how to listen, if we don't know how to really listen to the voice within us, to the voice greater than us, then we miss the message every time it comes through. And so meditation gives us the opportunity to learn to hear the whispers of your life as they are coming through and to you so that you can be on the track with your purpose, your mission, and your calling. I'll tell you something. When I had given up my marketing business to start doing music and speaking, my family thought I was crazy. They thought I was crazy. They thought I was literally having a mental breakdown. And, and I'm not being figurative. They thought I was having a meltdown. They were like, Justin, I think we need to have an intervention because I was giving up all these things that they saw as valuable to go after this thing that they thought was impossible. And if it wasn't for my meditation practice, I would have listened to their voices. And they didn't have harm, an intention of harm for me. They, tried to, they were trying to keep me safe. They cared about me. But because I had access to that voice greater than me and within me, I knew what voice to listen to. And if we don't have access to that voice, then we're letting the media decide for us. We're letting our friends decide for us. We're letting our parents decide for us. We're letting people decide for us who may have our best interest in mind, but who don't know the truth of what's inside of you. And if you don't have the meditation practice, then often what we're letting decide for ourselves when we think we're the ones deciding is we're letting our trauma decide for us. And so when you have a meditation practice, it starts to be this moment when we can really distinguish between fear and our intuition. And this leads me to a really important point. Anybody who's watching, wherever you are in the chat box, I want you to type in two important words. I want you to type in, type in the words. It's really three words that I want you to type in. I want you to type in fear and faith. Fear and faith. And when I'm talking about faith in this context, just know I'm not just talking about religious faith. I'm talking about the broader concept of faith, which means a complete confidence and belief in something. So yes, it includes religion because religious faith, but it also includes faith like I have faith in my friend. I have faith that my friend is going to come over to my house. So you can have faith in a lot of things. It's not in a spiritual way, right? So fear and faith are the exact same thing. They're the exact same thing. And when I say that, most people look at me and they go, what? Like, what do you mean? How are fear and faith the same thing? Well, listen, this is gonna be my mic drop moment, okay? Fear and faith are the same thing because both fear and faith require you to believe in something that you can't see and that hasn't happened yet. That's it. That's fear and faith. Choosing to believe in something you can't see and that hasn't happened yet. And so what are you going to believe? You're gonna believe in something either way. But if you choose fear, you go on the path of your demise. You go on a path where your trauma defines you. You go on a path where your circumstances limit your possibilities. When you choose faith, you choose to believe that something greater is possible for you. You choose to believe that there is a path forward that's bigger than anything that you're dealing with in your life right now. You're choosing to believe that you can and you will overcome. And thank goodness, our ancestors, all of our ancestors chose faith. Because think about the moments of slavery in the Jim Crow South. Think about the moments of slavery when things looked impossible. If our ancestors had chosen fear, where would we be today? If our ancestors let their circumstances choose their possibilities, where would we be today? Think about the women's movement. Think about the things that have happened here in our own city. If those people had chosen fear, where would we be? It takes those of us holding faith to bring freedom and change into the world. And we need resilience to do that. And so faith, meditation, fear, worrying, doubt, all of it goes together. And what meditation is, meditation is when you choose faith over fear. When you sit every day and you say, I'm choosing to remember who I really am and whose I really am. So this is the power of our practice. And what we're gonna wake up inside of you today is you learn to have faith in yourself. And then finally, my third point, 
Third point, so I got you already, right? Number one, it's really important about the propaganda of meditation. Number two is that it's not religious, but it can enhance your practice and that it's about listening to the messages from your higher self, whatever you call that higher self, regardless if it's God or spirit or the universe or crystals or unicorns or astrology or whatever you call it. It's about tapping in to be able to listen to that. And then number three, this is really important, is that meditation is not about getting your mind to stop thinking. Most people, and how many of you have heard that before, right? Oh, I just need to, I can't get my mind to slow down, right? I just need to get my mind to stop. I just need to get my mind to slow down. You don't need to get your mind to slow down. <laughs> you don't need to get your mind to stop. That's what we've been taught to believe that meditation is about. Meditation is not get, about getting your mind to stop thinking. Meditation is about getting our thoughts to work for us instead of against us. And so if you can worry, you can meditate. If you can worry, you can meditate. That's another one to type in. If you can worry, you can meditate. That's on the back of my book. My book is called Stay Woke, by the way, for those of you who are, who are wondering. So Stay Woke, a meditation guide for the rest of us that really brings these practices to all of us who may not have had these practices before, brings them back to us in a way that helps us make change in the world. And so if you can worry, you can meditate. It's right on the back of the book. Why? Because when they scan our brains, I'm a total neuroscience geek, by the way, y'all. I'm very woo-woo. I got the crystals and the whole thing, but I'm also a total neuroscience geek. I love the psychoeducation and everything, so I weave this together. When they scan our brains and they look at worrying and meditation, they look exactly the same inside of our brains. Because what are we doing when we worry? We're coming back to some centering negative thought over and over. You could be trying to work. You could be trying to study. You could be trying to make love. You could be trying to do all kinds of stuff, celebrate, have a party. You could be trying to do whatever you want. If you are worried, you come back to this centering negative thought over and over like a homing pigeon. When you meditate, we're asking you to do the same thing, to come back to a centering positive thought, a centering thought that's taking you towards your growth. And if you are not choosing and coming back to that, then we're letting fear take control. And so meditation is taking our power back, is letting us choose instead of letting the media choose. It's letting, not letting our trauma choose, is letting our possibilities choose. And so this is the power of our practice. So if you can worry, you can meditate. Most of y'all, yes, I'm pointing at you. Y'all know it gets serious when I start tapping on the screen. Most of y'all are expert meditators. You've just been meditating on the wrong stuff. You've just been meditating on the wrong thing. And so we're going to change that up today in today's practice. All right. So are y'all ready to do a little practice with me? Even if you've never meditated before or you've meditated many, many times in your life, I promise you that this practice is going to do something very special for you. Let me take a quick sip of water. Okay. So this practice that we're going to go through together is one of my favorites. It is called the Dream Bigger Meditation Practice. And the Dream Bigger Meditation Practice is really important. And I wanna start this practice by telling you a little story. Once upon a time, as the story goes, long ago, there was this river that was known all across the land to have the biggest fish that anyone had ever seen. This river was known far and wide, but you had to travel through really crazy terrain to get into the space of this river. You had to travel over mountains, land and sea to get to this special river. And in this river, you were gonna get the biggest fish that anybody had ever seen. And so this young fisherman travels for days and nights to get to this river. And he arrives at the river and he's getting his fishing pole and all his gear ready. And he looks across and sees this older fisherman fishing in the river. And he's watching the old fisherman. And he sees the old fisherman throw his fishing rod into the water, reel in a big fish, pull up this big, beautiful fish, and then throw it back in the, in the river. And the young fisherman's like, well, that was weird. Why would he do that? He just got a huge fish. And so he watches him again. And here's the old fisherman a few minutes later, reeling in another big fish, big fish. This one's even bigger. And he throws it back in. 
And the young fisherman is looking at him like, okay, what is going on? Because he's getting these big fish that people would really like want, but he's throwing them back in the water. So the young fisherman starts walking up to him and he sees him do it again, reels it in, big fish, throws it back. And the young fisherman finally says, what's going on? Why do you keep throwing these fish back in the water? And the older fisherman looks at the young fisherman and he says, well, young man, all these fish are great, but they're too big for my frying pan. They're too big for my frying pan. And the young fisherman, of course, is thinking, well, dude, maybe you should just cut them up or maybe you should just get a bigger frying pan. And I know this sounds so ridiculous when I share it this way, but the point is clear because we do this when we take the big fish out of our own lives. When we have our dreams and our goals that we're saying, that dream that I have, mm -mm, not for me, for somebody else because it's bigger than my frying pan. That idea that I wanna step into, nope, mm -mm, bigger than my frying pan. That art project, this body, all the things that I wanna step into, the relationship that I want, the marriage that I want, the family that I want, all the things that I'm stepping into, great for somebody else, too big for my frying pan. So yes, thank you universe for these ideas, but I'm gonna throw them back into the river so you can give them to somebody else. Thank you. That's what we do. And so in this dream bigger practice, I'm gonna invite you to get a bigger frying pan. I'm gonna invite you to the river with me. I'm gonna invite you to come forward and if it feels silly or impossible, good. I want you to imagine when we do this practice that you could rub a magic lamp, everything is possible, every circumstance overcome. Because if we can't think beyond our current circumstances, how can we live beyond our current circumstances? So let yourself go there with me today as we dream bigger. All right, so here's what I want you to do, everybody. Wherever you are, as long as you're in a safe place to do this, you ain't driving or anything, put your hands over your heart. Take a deep, full breath in and a breath out. And make sure your hands are not on your neck or your throat. We, wanna, we don't wanna limit your voice. We want the hands right over the center of your chest. And again, take a full, deep breath in and out. And if you feel comfortable doing so, I invite you to close your eyes. And if you can't close your eyes right now, that's okay. Just kind of drop your gaze down towards your desk or your feet or your bed or wherever you're at and let your vision blur out a little bit. And as you let that vision blur, it will make sure you don't get too distracted. Otherwise, have your eyes closed. And on the count of three, I want you to exhale everything out of your system through your nose. One, two, three. Exhale everything out and come to completely empty. Great. Now to my count of three, inhale for one, two, three. Hold for one, two, three. Exhale one, two, three. You're doing great. We're gonna do that a couple more times. I want you to breathe like all the way up into your jaw, like breathe into your collarbone, into your throat, into your jaw. We're gonna do that same count again. This is called the three count breath. Ready? Inhale, one, two, three. Hold for one, two, three. Exhale, one, two, three. I can already feel you can breathe deeper than that. So let's do it one more time, okay? Ready? Inhale, one, deeper, two, Collarbone, three, all the way up in your jaw. Hold it. And slowly exhale for one, two, three. And just relax. Soften into your body. And I'm going to invite you into a short visualization with me. And as we do this visualization, I want you to remember that some of us visualize by seeing images in our heads, but some of us don't visualize that way at all. Some of us visualize by hearing sounds in our minds. A lot of musicians will do this or smelling things or tasting things. A lot of people who love cooking will a masked way. 
really since you imagine with feeling in your body, a lot of dancers or people who are in their body will, will feel this way, athletes. So I say, imagine an ocean and you may not see it or hear it, but you can feel it or the temperature. And some of us imagine with our emotions, people who are Pisces like me, right? Real sensitive, like <laughs> we imagine with our emotions. So you might imagine with seeing things, hearing things, smelling, tasting, or any combination of them. But most importantly, I want you to know that if I'm asking you to see something or hear something and you don't see it or you don't hear it, don't force it. You're not doing it wrong, you're doing it right. Okay, let's begin. And if your mind wanders, it's normal. Just keep coming back. I want you to imagine that you walk up to that river. That river that has the biggest fish you've ever seen. The river of your dreams and your possibilities. And standing there at that river, you meet a future version of yourself. A future version of yourself who is living the life of your dreams. You have the body you've always wanted, you're in the house you've always wanted, you have the money you've always wanted. Everything in your life is exactly as you've always wanted. You can rub a magic lamp. Everything is possible. What do you notice? And now let this future you transport you into their life. So they take you away from the river and into the life of your dreams. Where did they take you? What's happening in this vision that indicates to you that you're living the life of your dreams? What's different? What's there? And let's start to dimensionalize this a little bit. Notice, did the future you take you somewhere that's indoor or outdoor? What colors do you see? Is there anybody there with you? And notice, as you scan around this future vision, and if your mind wanders, it's okay, just come back. As you scan around this future vision, notice, do you hear anything? Are there any sounds associated with the vision? Do you smell anything? Do you taste anything? Is there any physical sensation, maybe a temperature of this future use environment? And remember, don't force it. Are there any emotions related to this vision? How does it feel? And now I'm going to ask you a question. And I want you to answer this question using the very first one word that comes to your mind. Here's your question. With your eyes closed, as you look at this future version of you, what energy do you need to cultivate more of in your life now to become that person that you see in your vision? I'll ask the question again. Answer with the first one word that comes to your mind. What energy do you need to cultivate more of in your life now, today, to become that person? that you see in your vision. What energy, one word. And then just repeat that word in your mind a few times. Feel the energy of the word soothe you. Imagine the word could even turn into a color or a texture or a light. And on each inhale, imagine the energy of this word just showering you and bathing you and soothing you and healing you inside out, healing everything that you need from your body and mind and emotions. And now on each exhale, the second part is you're inhaling and getting what you need. Now exhale and offer that energy out to the whole city. Offer that energy out to everyone you love. Whatever that energy is, reciprocate. Offer it back up. Because the greatest law of receiving is the law of giving. And then take one more deep breath in, no matter where you are, and a breath out. And open your eyes. And wherever you are, 
watching from today, tuning in from today, I would love for you to type your words into the chat box, into the comments. Because here is how powerful what we just did was. And I want you to write your word down somewhere for yourself. And if you had multiple words, it's okay. You might've had two words or three words and you're wondering if that's okay, that's okay. But write them all down because here's what we just did, how powerful what we just did was. The words that you just created and came up with are what's called your unique energy signature. This is something I go in detail on in my book. And the unique energy signature helps you become who it is that you're meant to be. Because ultimately we said this, we said, here's who you are now. And here's who you want to become. And notice we said, there's a gap. Here's the you now, here's your future self. And notice we said, there is a gap between these two things. And I want you to notice that I didn't ask you, what do you need to do to fill the gap? I said, who do you need to be? Who do you need to become to fill the gap that is in your life? This is what we do with our unique energy signature. And so for some of you, your words are confidence. For some, it's joy. For some, it's love, freedom, creativity, power, discipline, love, connection. And so who you need to be, you know. And just like my Baca, my grandmother, stopped me in my tracks in that moment and had me listen inside. You just listen to the voice inside of yourself. Whether you've ever meditated before or not, you just did one of the most advanced practices. So I'm proud of you because you just listened to know what it is that you really need. And this is where real change and transformation begins. Because it can't just be about what you're doing. Remember what I said, there's a difference between change and transformation. Things change all the time, but the changes don't last if we haven't transformed. And this is why I call it in all of my work, inner activism. And sometimes when people hear me in activist circles, they hear me going inner activism and they roll their eyes like, come on, dude, this woo woo inner activism stuff. No, listen why this is important. Inner activism is important because of this. If we haven't really transformed within, then we'll keep doing all the external work and it will never have the lasting impact that we want it to have. And so what I'm saying is that the external work that we are all doing, the organizing, the trauma you're healing in yourself and in your family, the lives you're trying to create for yourself, the overcoming that you've done, that external work is so important that it must be met with the same level of commitment of our internal work so that all that external work can actually last. And so I know it sounds real kind of like, woo woo, okay, yeah, this is really philosophical, but let me just break it down for you really simply, okay? To talk about the difference between change and transformation. How many of y'all have been to a doctor, okay? And this is about the doing and the being. So you've been to a doctor and the doctor's doing the job of being a doctor but who they're being inside of the doctor job actually makes you feel worse than when you went in in the first place. And how many of us have been to a doctor who, yes, is doing the doctor job, they're busy, but who they're being is somebody who makes you feel loved and held and safe and compassionate, and they can even deliver the worst news to you and you still feel held. It's not just the doing, it's who we're being inside the doing. Educators know this. How many of us have had a teacher, right? A teacher in our lives who, who they were being inside of their teaching actually helped us become our highest self. So who is it that you're going to be inside all of the doing? That's how you get the freedom. That's how you transform. That's how you change. I'll give you one more example. Okay, this one, this one's gonna hit home for some of y'all, okay? So clutch your pearls. How many of us, I'm raising my hand for this one. How many of all of y'all have been in a relationship with somebody, whether it's romantic or not, got out of that relationship because 
you realize it wasn't good for you no more. It was toxic. It wasn't good. It was time to leave. Met a whole new person and soon realized you were in a new relationship, but it's really the same relationship with the same conversations, same problems, same drama, same stuff. I'm raising my hand because I've been there. And the reason why this happens is because if we haven't transformed within, we can't show up for any relationship differently, whether that's a relationship to a person, to your job, to your body, to your finances, to your creativity, or to social justice, equality, and change. If we have not transformed, the relationship that we're creating together cannot shift. So this is the inner revolution. This is is the inner resilience. And this practice takes resilience, and I'll tell you why. You know, we created a very special guided practice for you at We Rise LA, which you can find on the website. And this guided practice is a guided gratitude practice that helps you do a gratitude walk that you can get on the website. It's free for every single person. Just go to rerise.la and you can get the whole thing and the gratitude practice helps you recognize the power of who you are. And the reason why this is so important and relates to resilience, it's just a short audio practice, is this, is most people think that meditation is supposed to make you feel good. Mm -mm. Meditation is not about making you feeling good. Meditation is about making you feel, period. And so many of us have had so much practice in our lives and our lineages and our ancestors have had so much practice in their lives pushing things down because they had to. But we all know what happens when we push stuff down for too long. It ends up exploding in our lives in some place that it doesn't belong. And so our meditation time is a practice that we let those things come up because guess what? We're the first generation many times with the opportunity to even let this stuff come up and heal, like I said. And so as we sit together and do this healing work, you're learning to feel. You know, there's something called the wheel of emotions. And what happens with this wheel is it shows us all the different emotions that humans feel. Everything from sadness to joy to anger and love and connection and everything in between. And some of us are really good at experiencing sadness and really good at experiencing joy, but really bad at experiencing power or really bad at experiencing healthy anger. And so what happens with meditation and what resilience really is, the, the definition of resilience has a lot to do with the definition of mental health. Mental health and resilience is not always about feeling good. That's toxic positivity. Mental health and resilience is about being able to paint with the full spectrum and canvas of your emotional palette. So you can feel the joy and the pain. You could feel the sorrow and the loss and the grief, but the celebration and the happiness and the we rise together inside of all of it. And what happens when we meditate and what resilience really is, is we all kind of have this window of tolerance. So pretend this is your window of tolerance. I'm gonna give you a little lesson right now about emotions. So all of us, based upon our family, our history, our trauma, how we grew up, our family's emotional awareness and availability, we all have a window of tolerance. And pretty much anything emotional that happens inside of this window, we're cool with, right? We can feel that, we can feel that. Can... But as soon as it goes down here, is game over, right? Or even as soon as it goes up here, you're feeling too much joy. Whoop, let me put that down. Let me not celebrate. This is a big shadow of a lot of our activists and social justice communities. We have a win, but we're like, we can't celebrate that because no, there's still so much work to do. Yeah, there's work to do, but let's celebrate <laughs> right here, right now. You know what I mean? It's like, we have to give ourselves permission and so what meditation does and what resilience means is it expands the window of tolerance for us so you can see your full self inside of it and not have to limit your full expression and range of who you really are. So meditation allows us to expand that window of tolerance and that window of tolerance is what's known as resilience. And one of the big differences between people who experience post-traumatic stress and what's called post-traumatic growth 
or as Oprah recently called, post-traumatic wisdom with Dr. Bryce. The difference between someone going through, why is it that somebody could go through a trauma and after the trauma experience great purpose and meaning in their life? And then another person can go through the same trauma and their whole life falls apart. It all has to do with their post-traumatic growth. And post-traumatic growth is tied to our capacity for resilience. Because when we go through a trauma, we have to give ourselves the ability to have the freedom to experience what's really happening. The grief, the loss, the sorrow, whatever it is. But if we push it down because our tolerance is too low, then it just keeps seeping up and controlling our life from the background. And what's been proven and what we know is that meditation expands this window and helps us in many ways to experience the growth and the evolution that we desire, as well as many things, therapy and all these other things that help as well. But meditation is the integration ground for all of the other practices that you do. And so in closing, Graham Park, you know, I think back to my Baca, I have a little picture of her. Actually, I'll show you. <laughs> I have a little picture of her that I carry on my desk all the time. This is me and Baca together when I was a little kid. <laughs> and that's Baca and little baby Justin. And even though her passing was one of the most challenging things that I ever experienced in my life, it was definitely a trauma. She gave me the greatest gift, the greatest gift the gift of truly being alive, of truly living my truth, of truly stepping into the power of who I was meant to be. And my biggest prayer and my biggest hope is that I'm able to spread a little bit of Baca's wisdom out to all of you. Now, I know there's many of you who are wondering how to take this further, and I know there's a lot of resources and tools on the Grand Park website. And I also have tons of free meditations and practices and free things for all of us that you can check on my website at justinmichaelwilliams.com or you can go to my Instagram, which is at we just will. And most importantly, I want you to do this before we close. Actually, I wanna say this. You know, one of the tenets that's really important for me and why it was so powerful when I got asked to be a part of this incredible celebration that's happening across the city this month is because one of my tenants and one of my purposes is to bring these teachings and to bring access to these transformational teachings to people who may not have had access before. And so if you're somebody who is going through a hard time or you need help and you wanna be involved in any of my programs or anything, we always have free resources and scholarships and things like that available for everybody. We are here for you and we rise together. And I know Grand Park is here for you. And I love the, you know, my tagline in my, in my community is we rise together. And so it's no surprise that We Rise LA was a perfect fit for us to be together here as we grow in our freedom and change. So as we close our journey today, I'd like you to just place your hands over your heart one last time. Take a full deep breath in, a deep breath out. And just whisper thank you to yourself. You could be doing anything right now, but you showed up and you made this time for you. And in my community, in every event, we do this little practice called the golden nugget. And so what I want you to do is I taught you a lot today. We talked about fear and faith and meditation and prayer and listening and all kinds of different stuff and everything in between. Dreaming bigger, the river, change and transformation. I want you to think of if there was one main takeaway that you could take away from our session today. One thing, if there was only one thing that you could remember forever, what is that one most important thing that you got from today? Just one thing. And then maybe you make a commitment here and now to not try to go teach anybody anything, but to share something that you learned with someone you love or someone you know. Because this is how each of us becomes that ripple in the pond. And as my friend Shelly Tegelski always says, my colleague, with enough pebbles thrown into the pond at the same time, a ripple becomes a wave. So go ahead and type in the comments your main takeaway so we can see a cascade of takeaways of everybody who's watching and participating today. And my main takeaway is this, you are enough. 
you are worthy. And even though you're going through a lot right now, we all are, you're not broken. You are not broken. You are whole. And even as you try to grow and expand your capacity of who you are, you are enough. You are not broken, my dear. You are worthy. You are ready. And you deserve to live the life of your dreams. Thank you so much for being with me today, Grand Park. I love you all so much. We rise together. Bye for now.